Culture Counts by Serena Nanda and Richard L. Worms Chapter 10 Sex and Gender The Hijaras, an alternative gender in India The Hijaras are an ambiguous gender role in India. Although born male, they are considered neither man or woman. Hijaras undergo an operation in which their genitals are surgically removed. This procedure accounts for the popular designation of hijaras as eunuchs. Hijaras consider this operation a rebirth and is carried out as an act of devotion to the Hindu mother goddess. After the operation, hijaras are believed to incorporate the goddess's powers of procreation, thus their presence is required at weddings and at the birth of a child. Hijara performances involve clapping, drumming, and the tinkling of ankle bells, which announce their arrival. Tossing their spangled scarves, flashing their heavy jewelry, and beating their drums, hijaras sing and dance, making comic ribbalad gestures and striking sexually suggestive female poses, causing men to laugh and women to hide discreet, embarrassed giggling behind their hands. In celebrating the birth of a male child, the dancers will take the infant from his mother's arms and bless him with wishes for prosperity and fertility while examining his genitalia to confirm that he is a fully formed male infant. At the end of their performance, the hijars are given their traditional payment of money, cloth, and sweets, satisfied with having once again confirmed their importance in Indian society. Because they are born male, hijars are perceived as not man, but they are also thought of as man plus woman. They adopt women's clothing, gestures, and behaviors, They must wear their hair long, like women, and they have a special language that includes feminine expressions, intonations, and female kinship turns. But hijaras are also not women, mainly because they cannot bear children. As neither a man nor a woman, hijaras identify with the many ambiguous gender roles and figures in Hindu mythology and Indian culture. Male deities who change into or disguise themselves as females temporarily deities who have both male and female characteristics, male religious devotees who dress and act as women in religious ceremonies, eunuchs who serve in the Muslim courts, the ascetics or holy men of India whose renunciation of all sexuality paradoxically becomes the source of their power to bless others with fertility. Indian culture thus not only accommodates such androgynous features as hijaras but also views them as meaningful, sacred, and even powerful. Sex and gender as cultural constructs. India is one of many societies throughout the world where cultural support is given to individuals who transcend or bridge the difference between male and female. Bangladesh also contains hijar communities. Other alternative gender roles are the Mahu in Polynesia, the zenith of Oman, and the two-spirit found in many Native American tribes, the travesti of Brazil, the kathoe of Thailand, the bakla of the Philippines, the wara of Indonesia, the yan dodu of Nigeria, and the many gender alternatives of Malaysia. Most of these roles involve males who adopt women's work, dress, and behavior, but there are female alternative gender roles as well. Why do anthropologists study such esoteric subjects as alternative genders, and what can we learn from them? After all, the division of humans into the two opposite sexes, male and female, appears to be natural and a basic aspect of human biology. Sex assignment, which takes place at birth, is assumed to be permanent for a person's lifetime. Many of us take for granted that sex is the same as gender, and that people come in two opposing and unchangeable categories. But although every culture acknowledges the biological difference between male and female, there is a great cultural variety in the number of sexes and genders a society constructs and how sex and gender are defined. As Alex Yef and Besnier point out in their study of alternative genders in Pacific Island societies, understanding marginal gender roles helps us explore the gender norm, as well as the relationships between gender and sexuality, local and global dynamics, and historical change, and how those are considered 
marginal subvert or reinforce larger cultural and social structures. A basic anthropological subject is the distinction between biological and cultural aspects of being male and female. Sex refers to the biological difference between male and female, particularly the visible differences in external genitalia and the related difference in the role each sex plays in the reproductive process. Gender is the cultural and social classification of masculine and feminine. In other words, gender refers to the social, cultural, and psychological constructs that different societies superimpose on the biological differences of sex. Every culture recognizes distinctions between male and female, but cultures differ in the meanings attached to these categories and the supposed sources of the difference between them and the relationship of these categories to other cultural and social facts. As noted previously, gender is not limited to masculine and feminine, neither in fact is sex. In the United States in the 20th century, the parents of infants born biologically intersexed were persuaded by medical and psychological professionals to fix their sex through surgery and socialize with such infants into the gender consistent with their new altered sex. But more recent research indicates that there are many different kinds of biological intersex conditions and that the designation of intersexuality is, like the concepts of sex and gender, culturally constructed. Gender and gender relations are among the basic building blocks of culture and society, central to social relations of power, individual group identities, formation of kinship and other groups, and attribution to meaning and value. This makes gender a central interest of contemporary anthropology, understanding that gender roles are not biologically determined but rather are culturally constructed raises new questions about the culturally patterned nature of women's and men's lives in all cultures, including our own. Cross-cultural ethnography demonstrates that not only do different cultures incorporate different genders beyond those of men and women, but the concept of masculine and feminine also vary among cultures. Thus, to grasp the potential and the limits of the diversity in human life, we must look at the full range of human societies, particularly those outside Western historical, cultural, and economic traditions. We broaden our perspective on sex and gender beyond our own society. We see that culture counts. Both sex and gender are culturally constructed and extraordinarily diverse, as are the relationships between sex and gender. The work of anthropologist Margaret Mead was essential in developing the now central anthropological principle of the cultural construction of gender. In other words, gender characteristics are the result of historical, economic, and political forces acting within each culture. In the 1930s, Mead began to question the biologically determined nature of gender. In her famous 1935 book, Sex and Temperament in Three Primitive Cultures, she examined the behavior of men and women in three New Guinea societies, the Arapish, the Mandagumor, and the Chambuli. Mead found that the whole repertoire of behaviors, emotions, and roles that go into being masculine and feminine patterned by culture. Among the Arapish, men and women are both expected to act in ways that Americans considered naturally feminine. Both sexes were concerned with taking care of children and nurturing. Neither sex was expected to be aggressive. In the among the Amor societies, both sexes were what American culture would call masculine, aggressive, violent, and with little interest in children. Among the Chambuli, personalities of men and women were different from each other, but opposite to the American conceptions of masculine and feminine. Women had the major economic role and showed common sense and business shrewdness. Men were more interested in aesthetics. They spent much time decorating themselves and gossiping. Their feelings were easily hurt and they sulked a lot. Although Mead's ethnographic descriptions of these societies were later criticized and superseded, her work made a lasting contribution by raising the issue of great diversity in cultural definitions of masculine and feminine, and by calling attention to the ways in which gender and gender relations were cultural constructs. 
A society's gender ideology, that is, the totality of their ideas about sex, gender, and the natures of men and women, including their sexuality, and the relations between genders, is significant not only in their own right, but because it is the core element in a society's stratification system, which is also gendered. Creative Expressions of Gender Deep Play and Masculine Identity Every society includes many and varied cultural dimensions of gender ideology and gender identity. Games and sports such as football in the United States, cockfighting in Bali, rugby in Tonga, or bullfighting in Spain are all ways of both learning and reinforcing culturally constructed gender values. Clifford Gertz calls these activities deep play because they heighten emotions, display compelling aspects of social structure and culture, and reinforce culturally constructed gender identities. A prime example of deep play in the construction of masculinity is the Spanish bullfight. Although many outsiders and a growing number of Spaniards consider bullfighting a cruel assault on animals, bullfighting is traditionally an aesthetic ritual central in gender ideology, and most of the people who enjoy it do not view it as a form of violence or cruelty. Despite their violent acts, bullfighters are culturally compelled to restrain any sight of anger or aggression. Indeed, such signs contradict the essence of bullfighting as an art. In Spanish culture, bullfights involve a complex and elaborate process of ritualized violence that makes it not only acceptable, but also beautiful. The point of a bullfight is to not simply kill a bull. That would be easy and would lack any cultural meaning. Rather, it is the skill, grace, and courage of the bullfighter that is essential to the performance. The bullfight embodies the values of male competition and defense and of the male image of honor. For the audience, the maximum vindication of honor is the physical showdown in public between two men. The matador symbolizes the role of the honorable male. He is not a fighter or a man with a reputation for violence nor is he an athlete, personally aggressive, or necessarily big or muscular. In the bullfight, the bull is an angry and ferocious male, whereas the matador is skilled, self-controlled, and calm. He is able to master the violent situation without becoming violent himself. For the matador and the spectators, it is not the suffering of the bull, but the style and the aesthetic performance of the matador that is central. At the kill, the most dangerous part of the performance for the matador the matador cannot use his sword to weaken the bull or defend himself. Any prolonged suffering of the bull is strongly disapproved by the spectators, and a matador who performs a sloppy kill is called a murderer. For the Spanish, a bullfight is not an example of indulging in a man's animal nature, which is how they view a North American boxing match, but a performance that allows man to transcend his animal nature as it distinguishes a man of honor from a man of anger. Honor is a central concept in Spanish masculine identity and indeed in much of the Mediterranean culture. The art of the bullfight is one of the ways in which this central cultural value is expressed for both the performers and the audience. In spite of the well-established connection between bullfighting and masculinity in Spain, this cultural construct of gender is slowly changing. Over the past century, women in Andalusia in southern Spain have been fighting to enter the bull ring. Many Andalusians, however, including male bullfighters, reject this attempt to overturn traditional gender roles. Some male bullfighters refuse to fight in the ring with women. Parents discourage their daughters from pursuing a bullfighting career trainers refuse to train women bullfighters, and some spectators refuse to attend bullfights in which female bullfighters participate. But women bullfighters themselves are persisting, and some Andalusians support women's efforts. In contrast to those who reject women participating in this masculine example of Spanish deep play, some male Andalusians view the women as supremely courageous and professional, and find them in their tight costumes supremely sexy. But however one views female bullfighters, they certainly stretch the traditional notion of what it means to be a woman in Spain. On the Pacific island of Tonga, rugby is a form of deep play central to the construction of masculinity. 
Rugby is of English origin and was introduced to the Tonga in the early 20th century. Today, almost all Tongan boys play rugby from early childhood. Girls, in contrast, play netball, a watered-down version of basketball, which is of practically no public interest. Rugby is essential in male socialization. All Tongan villages and boys' schools have rugby clubs, and boys and many men play rugby informally almost every day. Rugby gives boys a chance to learn resourcefulness and skills to confound opponents central to the male gender role. For Tongans, rugby expresses ideals of virtuality, fortitude, and controlled aggression, and it favors the large, heavily muscular bodies of Tongan men, also central to masculine identity and pride. Ironically, because of a shortage of outstanding rugby players in Japan, where rugby is an elite but marginal sport, Tongan players have been recruited to beef up rugby teams. The Tongan players are viewed as both physically and socially unattractive. However, their corpulence, hairiness, crude manners, hard drinking, and chain smoking are identified as gorilla macho, the very antithesis of the contemporary Japanese ideal of slim macho, which incorporates a slim and well-groomed look. Such diversity of the constructions of masculinity from a cross-cultural perspective. Cultural variation in sexual behavior. Understanding gender systems as culturally constructive also helps explain the cultural variations and definitions of appropriate sexual behavior. Although sexual activity is most often, and for most people, viewed as doing what comes naturally, a cross-cultural perspective demonstrate that human sexual activity is patterned by a cultural gender ideology and influenced by learning. Culture patterns the habitual responses of different peoples to different parts of the body. What is erotic in some cultures is considered disgusting in others. Kissing, for example, is not universal. The Tahitans learned to kiss from the Europeans. Before this cultural contact, Tahitans began sexual intimacy by sniffing. Among the Alaskan Inuit, sniffing the hollow of an in another's cheek can be both a pattern of sexual as well as non-sexual behavior. When an adult asks a child to do this, it is affectionate and innocent, whereas among adults is considered quite erotic. Like a kiss in our own cultural, it is a social construct of behavior that counts. Sexual foreplay is also culturally diverse. In the Trobriand Islands, a couple expresses affection by expecting each other's hair for lice, a practice Westerners may find disgusting. To the Trobianders, however, the European habit of a couple going on a picnic with a knapsack of prepared food is equally disgusting, although it was perfectly acceptable for a Trobian boy and girl to gather wild foods together as a prelude to sexual activity. Who is considered an appropriate sexual partner also differs among cultures. In some societies, like the United States, same-sex practices may stigmatize men as homosexual, but same-sex intimacy may be a matter of indifference or even approval in other cultures. Among the Sambia of New Guinea, what Americans call homosexual practice is culturally central in the sex and gender system as a core ritual in male initiation. In the Sambian culture, women are viewed as dangerous creatures that pollute men and deplete them of their masculinity substance. The Sambia believe that males do not naturally mature as fast or as competently as females. The Sambia believe that males cannot achieve reproductive competence without semen, which is not naturally produced, but must be externally and artificially introduced into the body. Thus, an essential part of male initiation is for boys to consume semen from an adult man through repeated homosexual fellatio. Only in this way can boys become strong men, capable of becoming fathers and vigorous warriors. Among ancient Greeks, homosexual relationships were considered superior to heterosexual relations, and in many contemporary cultures such as India or Brazil, the male who takes the dominant role in same-sex relationships is not considered homosexual and his behavior is not stigmatized. In Thailand, 
As long as a man fulfills his family obligations to marry, his homosexual practice does not become a source of discrimination or dishonor. In many cultures, in which same-sex relationships are viewed as normal variants of human sexuality, contrast strongly with the prevailing view in the 19th and 20th century Europe and in the United States, where a consistent male heterosexuality was considered essential to masculine identity. The ages at which sexual response is believed to begin and end, the ways in which people make themselves attractive, and the importance of sexual activity in human life, and its variation according to gender, all these are patterned and regulated by culture and affect sexual response and behavior. Two classic ethnographies that highlight the role of culture in impacting sexuality are that of the Irish Enos Bang and that of the Polynesians of Mangia. Anthropologist John Messenger describes his Enos Bang as one of the most sexually naive of the world societies. Sex is never discussed at home when children are near, and parents provide practically no sexual instruction to children. Adults believe that after marriage, nature takes its course. Women are expected to endure, but not enjoy sexual relations. To refuse to have intercourse is considered a mortal sin among these Roman Catholic people. There appears to be a widespread ignorance of the Enos bang of female capacity for orgasm, which is considered deviant behavior in any case. Nudity is abhorred, and there is no tradition of dirty jokes. The main style of dancing allows little bodily contact among participants, even though some girls refuse to dance because it means touching a boy. The separation of the sexes begins very early in the Enos bang and lasts into adulthood. In sexual relationships, there is virtually absence of sexual foreplay, almost no premarital sex, and high percentage of celibate males. In explaining the extraordinarily late age of marriage, one female informant told the anthropologist, men can wait a long time before wanting it, but we women can wait a lot longer. The extreme sexual repression in the Enos Bang is usefully compared to the sexual ideology among the Polynesians of Mangia, described by Donald Marshall. Fantasies of complete sexual freedom in the South Seas have been a long part of Western culture. In fact, no society has complete sexual freedom, but compared to the traditional Puritan culture of the West, Polynesia comes closest. In Mangia, sexual intercourse is one of life's major interests. Sex is not discussed at home, but Mangia elders teach sexual information to boys and girls at puberty. For adolescent boys, this formal instruction about the techniques of intercourse is followed by a culturally approved experience with a mature woman in the village. After this, the boy is considered a man. This contrasts with the Enos Bang, where a man is considered a lad until he was about 40. In Mangia, there is continual public reference to sexual activity. Sexual jokes, expressions, and references are expected as part of the preliminaries to public meetings. And yet, in public, sex segregation is the norm. Boys and girls should not be seen together in public, but practically every boy and girl has had intercourse before marriage. The act of sexual intercourse itself is the focus of sexual activity. Both men and women are expected to take pleasure in the sexual act and to re reach orgasm. Celibacy is practically unknown. The contrast between Enos Bang and Mangia indicates clearly that society's different attitudes pattern the sexual responsiveness of males and females in each society. Gender Ideology in Women's Sexuality a culture's ideology always includes ideas about sexuality, and most societies view males and females as different in this respect. In societies where women are considered more sexually voracious than men, such as both Muslim and Hindu India, a clear contrast with the traditionally dominant Western view. This ideology is often used to justify men's control over women. 
This control becomes a basis for gender stratification, constraints on women's lives, and discrimination against women who work, go to school, or appear outside their homes without a male escort. It also may include control over women's dress, marriage, divorce, and laws regarding adultery and abortion. Male control over women in many societies, ranging from the horticultural Yanomamo to the contemporary post-industrial societies, is often expressed in the widespread violence against women, including beatings, rape, forced suicide, and even murder. Society's control of female sexuality may also be inscribed on females' bodies, such as female circumcision, Chinese foot biting, and in the West, anorexia and eating disorders motivated by the cultural ideal of model-like slimness. In many cultures, male control of female sexuality is central to notions of honor and shame, and thus to cultural understandings of masculinity. Violence against women today is also a political tool, illustrated by the widespread rape and warfare in the Congo, the Sudan, and the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, among other places, as an expression of social stratification, as in the recent gang rape of a lower caste young woman by the high caste men in North Indian village, or the part of the male culture in a high stratus college like Amherst in the United States, where college administrators look the other way and try to persuade rape victims to not bring charges. During the period of military rule in Myanmar, for example, the state demonized revered political activist and opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi in gendered and sexualized terms, holding that, like all women, she used female guile and manipulation to achieve her political goals. The government's propaganda held that, also like other women, she was driven by lust and thus unfit for any leadership roles. Although some cultural anthropologists emphasize the universality of certain gender ideologies, anthropology also emphasizes the significant diversity regarding women's sexuality both within and among cultures as affected by history, geography, economics, politics, and the impact of globalization. The issue of female modesty and control of sexuality in Islam proves a good example. Although Islam is a global religion, Muslim gender ideologies and practices regarding women's sexuality and requirements for modest dress vary in different Islamic societies. As illustrated by debates over the wearing of the hijab or headscarf for some Muslims as well as many non-Muslim Westerners, the hijab is a sign of the oppression of women, making them invisible and restricting their freedom of choice. But some Muslim women in Europe and the United States view the hijab as a liberating garment that forces the world to see them as more than sexual objects and establishes their identity as Muslims. The Quranic injunction requiring modest dress for Muslim women does not command any specific style, nor specifically mention hijab, making room for such a local variation and in interpretation. The varying practices regarding female modesty are shaped by history, culture, religious practice, and the degree of male dominance in the society. Factors influencing modest female dress vary among religious sects, among social classes, between rural and urban populations, and among the generations, ranging from the total restrictions on women's autonomy in Saudi Arabia to the split personality of the cosmopolitan Dubai. In some societies, most Muslim women only wear a hijab that loosely covers their hair and neck. In others, like Yemen, women wear a full head and body coverings as well as a face veil. In the airlines of United Arab Emirates, a compromise is reached between fashion and religion as air hostesses wear jaunty little caps attached with gauzy scarves that hint at hijab. In Afghanistan, under the Islamic State, women were required to wear a burqa or a full-body face covering. These restrictions weakened with the defeat of the Taliban. In all of these countries, some women resist the laws and customs, with varying responses from both public and public officials. In Tunisia, with the support of international non-governmental organizations, 
the great increase in women working outside the home, and important socioeconomic changes impacted by globalization, particularly the tourist industry, wearing a veil in various religious-based laws regarding polygamy, child custody, divorce, and unequal inheritance have become issues for debate in this still patriarchal society. In Turkey, although women commonly wear the headscarf in public, until recently they were previously not permitted to wear it in government offices or universities. Wearing the hijab is part of a heated public debate about what should be the secular versus religious character of this largely Muslim state. Cultural anthropologist Pardis Madavi makes an important contribution to this discussion through her ethnography in the Islamic Republic of Iran. In Iran, women are required to wear the hijab, and wearing a chador is increasingly common because of the government and some public pressure. Madavi's ethnography of sexuality in Iran, however, describes the widespread breach of many Muslim sexual restrictions, such as premarital chastity, marital fidelity, and wearing of modest dress among the educated upper-class Iranians. Dating, fashion, nail polish, makeup, and immodest dress are outlawed in Iran, but the formerly widespread policing of these practices in public places has diminished greatly, and girls wearing layers of makeup in private. Women's more modern headscarves are often so transparent and fashionable that they actually look sexy. The relation between gender practice and culture particularly impacts men in the Muslim diaspora. As anthropologist Catherine Ewing demonstrates, German society demonizes Turkish Muslim men as the other, bearers of Islamic barbarism who are associated with the repression and abuse of women as victims of patriarchal oppression. These German assumptions about the Turkish masculinity play a central role in the construct of German national identity, reinforced by the popular media, films, social work policies, and public policy, assumptions that Ewing points out are based on long-standing European fantasies about Middle Eastern gender relations are contrasted with European Enlightenment. This deep study of cross-cultural variation is one of anthropology's most important contributions, and it also helps us reflect more deeply on our own cultural values in the intensely emotional area of gender. Male and female rites of passage. In all cultures, the role expectations of individuals change at different points in life, and the individual must learn what is necessary for these new roles. In many societies, the transition from one social status to another is formalized by special rites of passage, which move individuals publicly and ceremonially from one stage of life to the next. One widespread rite of passage signals the transition from childhood to adult gender roles. Male rites of passage have an important psychological and sociological functions. They reinforce the social order by dramatizing the cultural values in the public context. They express and affirm male relationships, male solidarity, and sometimes male dominance. They publicly validate and change the status from child to adult and they transmit the cultural knowledge necessary to being a responsible male adult in the society. These initiation rites often involve an extended period during which boys are separated from the larger society, which emphasizes the importance of an individual's responsibility to his kinship group as well as the larger community. Rites often include painful experiences such as scarification or circumcision that symbolize the formal transition from child to adult. Such rites may also include difficult and dangerous tasks such as killing a large animal, which test a boy's preparation for the obligations of male adulthood. Among the Maasai, a herding society in Kenya, male initiation rites are part of an age-graded social system. Males follow a well-ordered progression through a series of age grades. Entry into requires a formalized rite of passage. After childhood, boys are initiated as warriors, and they remain in that stage for about 15 years. Warriorhood is a period of training in social, political, and military skills, and is traditionally geared to warfare and cattle raiding. 
The warriors then graduate ceremonially to a less active stage, during which they can marry, and then finally to elderhood in great ceremony. Male rites of passage have been interpreted as means of psychologically separating boys from identification with their mothers, as a symbolic appropriation of fertility related to male reproductive capacities as a fertility cult in which men celebrate and ritually reproduce their control over the fertility of crops, animals, and humans. These rites also have an important social function. They bring together boys from different parts of the tribe and serve as a lifetime source of solidarity and political integration into social systems that have little formal or central government. Although masculinity does take different forms in different cultures, a very widespread cultural pattern is one in which men must prove themselves to be virile, successful in competition with other men, daring, heroic, and aggressive, proving their manhood in formal rights and more informally on the streets and bars or in warfare. The Chuck Micronesia, for example, male adolescents engage in excessive drinking and violent brawling, an expression of a cultural concept of masculinity that is defined by competitiveness, assertiveness, risk-taking in the face of danger, physical strength, and physical violence. Recently, the Chinese government has put out the call for more male teachers in order to make boys men through boys-only martial arts classes or teaching stories of heroic Chinese men. Anthropologist David Gilmore calls this widespread male need to publicly test and prove one's manhood, the manhood puzzle, to question of why manhood needs to be proved, why it is regarded as so uncertain or precarious that manhood requires trials of skill, endurance, or rituals. Gilmore suggests that cultural patterns of proving manhood help ensure that men will fulfill their roles as procreators, providers, and protectors of their families. This essential contribution to society, he argues, is at the heart of the macho masculine role and accounts for its intensity, near universality, and persistence. Female rites of passage are more widespread than male rites, although generally less spectacular and intense. Female initiation into adulthood is often performed at the first menstruation, but there is much cross-cultural variability. Sometimes the initiate is isolated from society. Sometimes she is the center of attention. Some rituals are elaborate and take years to perform. Others are performed with little ceremony. As with male rites, female initiation rites also have multiple interpretations. In matrilocal societies, in which the young girl continues her childhood task in her mother's home, the important function of the rite is to publicly announce the girl's status change, as she will now carry out these tasks as a responsible adult, and to teach girls what they need to know to be effective adults. Female rites of passage also channel sexuality into adult reproduction and in some rituals, the rites emphasize the connections between beauty, sexuality, and power. These rites in New Guinea, for example, motivates girls to bear and rear children, strengthen their fortitude, and to provide them with the capacity for hard work necessary to assist their husbands in gathering wealth. Power and Prestige Gender Stratification A central concern in anthropology is gender stratification. Anthropologists have long debated whether male dominance is universal, and if so, why is it so? The interests of addressing these situations, anthropologists look at the social and cultural significance of women's roles as mothers, sisters, wives, and daughters, women's economic contributions in different types of societies, informal as well as formal sources of women's power and influence development of women's identities, and changes in all these dimensions as a result of historical factors, particularly colonialism, technological and economic change, and globalization. One early anthropological theory addresses the widespread, some say universal, subordination of women to men is called the private-public dichotomy. This theory holds that female subordination is based on a woman's universal role as mothers and homemakers, 
occupying a domestic private world that is less prestigious than the public world dominated by men. But a closer look indicates that the private-public dichotomy is not universal, but rather characterized a highly gender-stratified 19th century capitalist societies, which as those of Victorian Europe and the United States. In these societies, productive relationships moved out of the household and middle-class women retreated into the home, where they are supposed to concern themselves solely with domestic affairs, repress their sexuality, bear children, and accept a subordinate and dependent role. The private-public dichotomy seems less applicable to smaller-scale non-Western societies where home, family, economics, and politics are not so easily separated, and where women play a role, though perhaps not as easily observable role, in economic production and distribution. With increasing Western influence on these societies through capitalism, Christian missionaries, and colonialism, the public-private dichotomy became more relevant context for gender stratification. Other anthropologists have used controlled cross-cultural comparisons to understand male dominance. Sande, for example, concluded that male dominance was not universal, but occurred in connection with ecological stress and warfare, where the survival of the group rests more on male actions, such as warfare, women accept male dominance for the sake of social and cultural survival. Gender relations, complex and variable. Anthropological debates and earlier gender studies focused on which gender dominated a society. Structural male dominance called patriarchy was considered universal or nearly so, although matriarchy or female dominance was held to exist in some societies. Although anthropologists generally do not find matriarchies where women hold power equal to that of men in matriarchies, there is more recognition today that female power does find a place in many societies. With a greater understanding of complexity and variability with gender stratification systems, anthropologists today have moved to the question of whether male dominance is universal to the relations of gender stratification in particular societies. This has led to the closer examination of sexual division of labor and in different types of societies of the informal as well as the formal basis of female power. Gender Relations in Foraging Societies Earlier anthropological descriptions of foraging societies viewed hunting, a largely male activity, as the major source of food supply, providing the basis of male dominance in these societies. Later ethnographic studies have modified this view. In many foraging societies, women make a very significant contributions to the food supply by gathering vegetables. In other societies, women also substantially contributed to the food supply by hunting, although in different ways and for different kinds of animals than men hunted. These contributions by women to the society's food supply were an important source of female power. The Lingit of the northwest coast of North America is a foraging society in which women traditionally had equal power and prestige with men. Important Lingit roles were based on individual ability training and personality rather than on gender. Both Lingit women and men achieve prestige through their own efforts and their own kin relationships. Women may be heads of clans or tribes and the Lingit aristocrats are both male and female. Titles of high rank are used for both men and women, and the ideal marriage is between man and a woman of equal rank. The prestige of the Lingit achieved through extensive trade and other coastal societies is open to both men and women. Although long-distance trade is centered on men in the past, women often accompanied the men, acting as negotiators and handling the money, and both girls and boys were, and are today, expected to work, save, get wealth, and goods. Gender egalitarianism continues to be a core of Lingit cultural value. Today, women occupy the highest offices of the native corporations administering Lingit land and are employed by the government, social action groups, business and cultural organizations, and voluntary associations. 
Lingit women take advantage of the educational opportunities and easily entered modern professions. Unlike many non-Western societies, where European contact diminished women's economic roles and influence, modernization expanded Lingit women's roles and modern gender egalitarianism is not experienced as diminishing men who encouraged their wives and daughters to go into public life. Gender relations in horticultural societies. Generally speaking, women have more autonomy and power in egalitarian foraging societies than in horticultural, pastoral, or agricultural societies. But again, there is great cross-cultural variation. For example, the Iroquois of the eastern United States are highly egalitarian, whereas the Yanomano of Venezuela and Brazil are highly sex-segregated and male-dominated, as are most of the societies in Highland New Guinea. A high degree of sex segregation, paralleled by the importance of males in ritual, is associated with male dominance in some horticultural societies. Among the Mundukru of South America, for example, adolescent boys are initiated into the men's cult and thereafter spend most of their lives in the men's house, only visiting their wives who live with the children in their own huts in the village. The men's cults exclude women and are surrounded by great secrecy. The men's house itself is usually the most imposing structure in the village and houses the cult paraphernalia and sacred musical instruments, which are flute-like in shape, like male genitalia, and are the symbolic expressions of male dominance, just as the men's house is an institution of male solidarity. The solidarity of women in cultural societies usually is not formalized in associations, but is based on the cooperation of domestic life and strong interpersonal bonds between female kin. In sub-Saharan Africa, for example, the most important economic and emotional ties for both men and women are more likely to be between generations than between spouses. Women's most important ties are with their children, particularly their sons, on whom women depend on for emotional support and security in old age. Women, like men, also use kinship ties with their natal groups to gain access to land, gain support in marital disputes, and participate in ritual activities. In parts of West Africa, women's power is expressed through political office, and also through formally organized secret societies, such as the Sand Society of Sierra Leone. Contemporary ethnography demonstrates that women's power and influence sometimes go beyond their economic contributions their significant roles within households and families, and even beyond formal political offices, sometimes occupied by women. An important dimension of female power may rest on female alliances and participation in networks and groups outside the household that provide areas for entertainment, prestige, influence, and self-esteem. Anthropologist Annette Weiner, for example, demonstrated the important exchanges among women in the Trobian Islands, where the emphasis on male kula exchanges had excluded any anthropological attention to women's participation in exchange networks. In some societies, like the Yoruba of the West Africa, power is conceptualized as a vital source present in all living things. Personal power may be projected through certain body parts, for example, the eyes, mouth, hands, and fingers, and genitals. Power associated with sexuality and reproduction is especially strong and potentially dangerous and polluting, especially female genital power. Indeed, the universal covering of female genitals may be well related to the power of these body parts. The impact of European expansion on women in horticultural societies varied. Generally, women's roles declined as indigenous economies shifted from subsistence horticulture to cash crops sold in the world market. Among the Nukamu, a Pacific Island society, women's primary responsibilities were domestic, whereas men contributed food acquired at longer distances from home through fishing, collecting shellfish, and collecting and husking coconuts. Men also made canoes and constructed new buildings, whereas women cooked food and collected and prepared leaves for thatch. Both women and men's roles were highly valued in the traditional Nukumanu society. 
Women exclusively controlled and cultivated swamp taro lands, which were inherited matrilineally. Matro locally added to the women's status, whereas men's power came from their economic contribution and their extensive occupation of formal positions of power in the chiefly hierarchy. With the advent of German colonial occupation in the 1880s, most of Nukumanu was turned over to the production of copra. Wage laborers were brought in from nearby islands. Commercially marketed foods such as wheat, flour, and rice supplanted taro, and men's wages were needed to buy coffee, tea, and sugar. As a result, women's traditional sphere of influence and their status declined, whereas men's spheres of power expanded. Traditional segregation of men's and women's activities also intensified. Kariv was introduced in the 1950s, and men's economic activities, such as canoe building, took on a social aspect involving drinking. Because Kariv production and consumption takes up much of men's leisure time and excludes women, sexual segregation increased. As taro declined in importance, women's collective activities became more individualized leaving them more isolated and dependent on their husbands and brothers than previously. Male-female tensions also increased partly in result of Kariv drinking, which many women vehemently oppose. The traditional tendency for men to travel off the island more than women also lowered women's status. And even today, men primarily go overseas for wage labor and higher education. More recently, however, more women are leaving the island to take advantage of educational and career opportunities, and the prestige, money, and social influence on such women may move Nakamunu back to its tradition of sexual egalitarianism. Gender Relations in Pastoral and Agricultural Societies Pastoral and agricultural societies tend to be male-dominated although there is some variation. In pastoral societies, women's status depends on the degree to which the society combines herding with cultivation, its specific historical situation, and the diffusion of cultural ideas, such as Islam. Generally speaking, women's contribution to the food supply in pastoral societies is small. Men do almost all the herding and most of the dairy work as well. Male dominance in a pastoral society is partly based on the required strength to handle large animals, but females sometimes do handle smaller animals, engage in dairy work, carry water, and process animal byproducts such as milk, wool, and hides. Pastoral societies generally do not have the rigid distinction between public and domestic roles of agricultural societies. Herders' camps typically are divided into male and female spaces, but both men and women work in public, somewhat blurring the private-public dichotomy. In pastoral societies, men predominantly own and have control over the disposition of livestock, which is an important source of power and prestige. However, the deposition of herds is always subject to kinship and rules and responsibilities, and men and women may jointly hold animals. Still, the male economic dominance in pastoral societies seems to give rise to the general social and cultural male dominance, reinforced by patricentric kinship systems and the need for defense through warfare. Again, this generalization is subject to variation. Among the Tuareg of Central Sahara, for example, which is a matrilineal society, women generally have high prestige and substantial influence. Tuareg women do not veil their faces. They have social economic dependence and can own property, including herd animals, and have the freedom of movement. There is minimal sex segregation, and women organize many social events as singers and musicians. Although the traditionally high status of Tuareg women and the matrilineality itself is determined today by the migration of men to cities, where they work for wages, and by the incorporation of the Tuareg into larger nation-states. With their patrilineal cultures, city may also provide increasing opportunities and freedom for Tuareg women. In agricultural societies, with the use of plows, the direct female contribution in food production generally drops drastically, though this varies. Women, for example, play important productive roles in wet rice agriculture. 
As women's economic contribution declines, they lose status, and this also generally accompanied by their increasing isolation and domestic worse in the home and increasing numbers of children. Machine technology reduces the overall labor force, and this also particularly affects women who are disproportionately excluded from mechanized agriculture. Women are also paid lower wages as agricultural laborers and are concentrated in such labor-intensive agricultural tasks as weeding, transplanting, and harvesting. Also, as men more easily enter the cash economy, selling crops and animals, transition to this economic system in most cases also lowers women's status and makes them more dependent on men. Women's status in modern stratified societies varies greatly and is affected by economic development, political ideology, and globalization. Women have been highly involved in the global economy, primarily through the expansion of industrial production by multinational corporations in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. As urban lifestyles and industrial production replace rural lifestyles and agriculture, women may even benefit relative to men. For example, in the Mata Chico, Peru, in the 1930s, the only way for a woman to get land, a critical resource, was to marry. But by the 1980s, as Peru became increasingly urban, many occupations were available to both men and women. Because women could support themselves and their children through employment in urban areas, they began to remain single longer and in some cases chose to not marry at all. Using Anthropology Economic Development for Women As with colonialism, foreign aid and development programs often fail because they increase male productivity, they neglect the economic role of women. Indeed, development programs may actually increase gender inequality. Where anthropologists are involved in development projects, however, more attention may be paid to women's roles. Anne Dunham, an anthropologist, craftsperson, and weaver, did her fieldwork in Indonesia and was particularly interested in craft marketing, an important potential source of income for village Indonesians. Dunham became particularly interested in the economic possibilities of marketing and later worked for the Ford Foundation and U.S. Agency for International Development, development projects in Indonesia and Pakistan. Her fieldwork findings challenged the then common notion that the culture of the poor themselves created the roots of poverty, a view portrayed by one of anthropology's most prominent anthropologists, Clifford Gertz, who worked in Indonesia 25 years before Dunham. In contrast to Gertz, Dunham observed that the underdevelopment in these village communities largely resulted from a scarcity of capital. As a development anthropologist, Dunham, who also worked with international organizations like the World Bank and the Ford Foundation, set up credit operatives for Indonesian women, street food sellers, factory workers, handloom weavers, shop girls, and scavengers. Women mainly worked in Indonesian markets, a form of essential part of the economy and family. The success of the Grameen bank project of micro-lending for women, which results in their increasing prestige, income, and autonomy, confirmed Dunham's anthropological insights about the potential of the village women. The global marketing of women textiles and pottery from Mexico and Guatemala has also proved to be economically successful, although it has been sometimes led to greater tension and even violence between men and women. As anthropologists increasingly point out, the impact of development projects on women is a result of the interplay of specific economic and cultural conditions in a particular society. Gender Hierarchies and Wealthy Nations In spite of gender egalitarian ideologies, even the wealthy nations of Europe, Asia, and North America, the status of women is not equal to that of men. In the United States, for example, the view that women should be excluded from all but domestic and child-rearing roles has historically been culturally dominant and remains so among many Americans today. Although American women have made great strides in professions such as law, medicine, academia, there is still much stereotyping and discrimination. More women than men may go to medical school, but they tend to take on less prestigious medical specializations after graduation. 
even in academic anthropology, where women like Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict are among our most influential and celebrated elders. Women's rates of promotion into full professor lag behind the rates of men. Until the 20th century, women in the United States were denied many rights granted to men. They could not vote until 1920 and in many places could not serve on juries until the middle 20th century. Even today, the numbers of women in Congress are decidedly small, and as of this writing, there has yet to be a female president or vice president. Domestic violence, sexual harassment, and continued attempts to constrain women's reproductive rights and other significant problems are still being fought in the United States. Gender identities and gender stratification are taught from infancy. Some progressive societies like Sweden, a real effort has made to blur gender differences. Teachers avoid the pronouns him and her and avoid gender nouns like girl and boy. The library contains few classic fairy tales such as Cinderella or Snow White, which are laden with gender stereotypes. Boys as well as girls are allowed to cry and neither sex is admonished for engaging in activities typically associated with the other gender, though there appears to be less opposition to girls taking on boys' roles than the opposite. The Swedish government and public realize that erasing gender stratification must begin early. Contemporary societies, such as Vietnam, for example, are also transforming gender ideology and practice in the transition from state socialism to partly neoliberal market economies. Early socialist ideology proudly announced its support for gender equality, but today it has tweaked that notion as it encourages women to participate in the new economy. Previously, socialism had denigrated petty traders, most of whom were women, as part of an unpatriotic and anti-revolutionary class motivated by personal monetary gain. But to capitalize on the growing economic importance of these markets, especially for the increasing international tourist trade since the end of the Vietnam War, The Vietnamese government currently emphasizes how market trade is particularly suited to women's innate gendered personalities. Women realize the advantage of this gender construct themselves and encourage it by denigrating their status in relation to their customers. Engaging in flattery and sweet talk with their customers, and perhaps most importantly, defining men as innately incapable of successfully engaging in such trade. For the government, this New feminine gender construct also turns women into productive class in the socialist system. Thus do economies, politics, and gender construction interact in the contemporary world.